office. So I'm stuffed in our bedroom and grandson's running around outside. So I'm kind of hiding. <laughs> Those guys are crazy. Yeah, they're doing they're doing pretty good with everything going on, you know. Grandson's running around outside, so I'm kind of hiding. Oh, sorry. Oh. We're good. Here we go. I think we're live now. So welcome everybody. I am uh, Virgil Moorhead Jr., part of the Big Lagoon Rancheria and the Behavioral Health Director here at Two Feathers Native American Family Services. And we are on our virtual indigenous speaker series and we have a star studded lineup of local celebrities today. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Bubba. But before that, I just want to pay honor and, and recognize that uh, Two Feathers is on the land of the Weot people. So I wanna honor the, the Weot people and the land that Two Feathers and currently I'm on. Uh, so uh, Bubba. Right on, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we got three of maybe my favorite people around. Uh, it's up for debate though, I don't know. Oh. No, but uh, so who we have joining us today is uh, Shauna McCovey. She is Yurok and Kaduk and a noted poet, poet and writer. Shauna's work has been published in anthologies, magazines, and news journals. She is the author of The Smokehouse Boys. And she has earned a graduate degree in social work from HSU and a Juris Doctorate from Vermont Law School. Hi, Shauna. Hi, everybody. And so we've also got Chad Lowry. He is Yurok, Maidu, and Achimoe. An award-winning author, Chag, is a graphic novelist. He is the author of three books, including The Original Patriots, Northern California Indian Veterans, World War II, and his most recent publication, Soldiers Unknown. How's it going, Chag? Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming. And last, but certainly definitely not the most least, we have at Mr. Almy Allen up Carver himself. He is a Yurok in Kaduk and a well-respected local artist. Almi began to participate in the Kaduk traditions at an early age and is now a cultural leader himself. He has completed public murals, facilitated art, art workshops for youth and community, and has administered carving projects with young men. How's it going, Almi? Hey, pretty good. Thanks so much to uh, have me on today. It's an honor to be with these two. Right on. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit today about um, like the role that art has played for our people. Um, I, I think that's a, so I think a good place to start um, is asking you guys, you know, your medium, um, the because I, between the three of us, three of you guys, we have uh, multiple different, you know, types of art. You know, um, so I think that we'll get started by asking you what your guys' medium is and kind of how you got started doing what you're doing. So whoever wants to go ahead, go first. You want me to go first? I'll go first. That works. All right. Um, so I write poetry. Uh, I write other things too. I've done a little bit of nonfiction uh, type essay writing. So when I was younger, I used to want to write fiction, but I don't know. I think that's hard. Um, but but uh, I've always written, like I started a, in the bio on my book, it says that I wrote my first poem when I was six. And I did, I can still remember laying on the floor at my house uh, on the Ark Reservation, like writing out this little poem. So um, it's just something that has always been with me and I've always done. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know where it comes from, but it, it comes from somewhere. Right on. You've got the yellow light on you, Chag. <laughs> I'm like, yep. Chag. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, first, I'm very honored uh, to be here with Shauna and Almy, uh, two people who I really love and admire and respect. And I think, you know, starting at a young age, I always wanted to try and write for my people. And I always wanted to try and find a way to give space for our indigenous artists and language speakers and elders and veterans, try to give them space to share about who they are. So I uh, kind of a dual role, I, you know, both as a writer, but then also, you know, try to facilitate 
opportunities for artists so that they can share in a safe space, a safe environment. And um, that's how I've been able to work with so many great people like Shauna and Almi. Yeah, so my medium, uh, for those that don't know me and uh, my background, I was raised in uh, Orleans, California, um, upriver, sorry, I get the tag, upriver Allen. Uh, that's my home place and that's my connection. That's my root. Um, and that's what keeps me solid uh, driving forward in this community. Um, uh, all, all of those experiences um, in, in, that, in that place there. So starting there, you know, uh, I always, uh, I can't think of a time that I wasn't doing art or I wasn't doing and creating something with my hands, but it was later in life that things came about and manifested the way they have uh, with my work. And uh, I was always an art student. I was always a student of uh, wood and that industry. Um, but it was, uh, you know, um, 20 plus years ago that I, I started really doing this work in public and um and uh, like murals and then uh later it ended up being uh you know my carving and so you know probably known more right now as a carver but i have to get back to my painting and um and we'll get on with that more later in this interview but also you're going to find out the connections between shauna and myself and me and Chegg. And Ed Chegg and Shauna and vice versa. So I don't even know if you guys realize what you guys had going here uh, when you hooked us all up, but we all have connection. Shauna and I grew up together. Uh, we played on the same little league team. Okay. So we'll get into that later. She was my back, second baseman. Back in 1982, 83. Yeah. Yeah. So we grew up from like, you know, from day one. So um, we were always connected in that way. But basically, to kind of sum it up, my medium, um, it's anything I get my hands on. And lately, it's been traditional art. It's been the carving. And I've found ways to impact community, my community uh, through that. And it's a really neat thing. It's a really good thing. Uh, concluding this little part, um, one thing I told uh, one of my last carving classes was, uh, and this took some searching inside of me, was, uh, can you will your hands and your body to do what your mind sees? And for me, that's kind of where, where I'm at right now. And that's my words of inspiration for, uh, especially like young carvers, young painters, whatever. Take from your culture and, and will it. Can you make it happen? And you find out everybody's got it in them. Some just more than others. Thank you. Uh, I have the next uh, question as a follow-up kind of to what Elmi uh, just said is, what are the ways that our local cultural traditions, whether it's our ceremonies or some of our beliefs or our own stories here locally, uh, have shaped your work? Uh, and you know, how have you used some of those stories, traditions, or ceremonial ways in your work? And uh, I'll throw it at uh, Shauna. Yeah, so I can think of, a, uh, well, lots of examples, but... Um... I grew, I grew up and I went to my first brush dance at Shragon when I was a little kid. And uh, so I started, I was, you know, I didn't, I wanted to learn so much more about the culture than I was learning at the time. And, and you know, um, throughout time, I, I, I just started going to ceremonies and just wanting to be a part of that world and understand it more and then write about it because I, I felt like growing up, and then especially when I got into college, there just wasn't there weren't enough stories. Our stories, our local stories, no, no one was telling those stories. Not not to the degree that we should have been. And um, so, culture, like culture and our traditions and who we are and where we come from, inform everything that I like. I, I bring it into everything because I, I feel like it's it's the most important piece of probably each poem that I write is just the the making sure that somebody whoever's reading it and i write for i write for our people you know i don't, I don't necessarily write for the poetry world or anybody like that i write for our people because i want them to be able to see themselves in the poem. and so pulling that culture in is is really the best way to do that so that they know that when they're seen and they're and they're proud of who they are in the community 
Thank you for that. Can I just comment um, real quick before the next person goes is that, um, you know, so my grandfather has a large uh, library collection and, you know, a lot, a lot more focus on like native um, writings and, you know, books. And it's just like a childhood memory is seeing the Smokehouse Boys um, on my grandfather's nightstand and like reading it at like seven or eight years old. Um, and so I, just, I recently rebought it my own collection but uh, so it just kind of speaks to how you said that you write for your people you know I, this is before I even knew you person to person but you know I seen Sean and McCovey and I was like hey I'm a McCovey this is pretty cool that this is you know my family that you know and here's this book that I get to read so just it, I drew that connection when you mentioned that you write for the people So what about you, Almi? Hey, so glad you asked. Yeah, so anyway, um, I kind of knew it was coming. Uh, so uh, how Wait, is you got the, the questions ahead of time? <laughs> <laughs> I had to go back through the text. Uh, so how has the, the culture and the traditions impacted me or my art? Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's been substantial for me and I call it, you know, my journey. And, um, and I remember uh, talking to folks uh, about it up at Humboldt State um, when we did the big opening and unveiling for Indigenous Peoples Week. And uh, my work up there, the, the benches, the public benches, and then we had the art show at the Guditni. Um, but, you know, kind of recounting it all, um, you know, and as, as Bubba, you know, introduced me as, it, you know, I started the uh, being involved in the traditions at an early age, you know, being involved in pick yawish, a bit ketamine. And so I always had that, you know, as, as, um, as, as my foundation, but it was really around, um, 99, 2000 when, uh, when we rebuilt the dance house at ketamine and, uh, the, uh, the old man, uh, uh, poor old Charlie Tom, he's gone now, uh, him and my late father-in-law Amos, they decided that um, they'd, they'd have me rebuild that. And so at the time I was like 30 years old and you know, plenty of knowledge with doing, this, doing the work, uh, but not you know, building a ceremonial house. So over the course of the next year or two, uh, we did it and it gave me so much confidence and in, in to, in to see what it did in our community. Um, and I felt so grateful to be to to be asked to do that. And I remember what Charlie told me was, um, he said, you know, um, we had our turn, you know, and he had rebuilt that that house a couple times himself. And he goes, now it's your turn, like your generation. And if you knew Charlie, um, the way he spoke, he was a Kaduk uh, uh, language speaker first, English second. So you had to understand and how he talked and, and and how it all came about. But it was really cool being around people like that in the growing up in the 70s and the early 80s because it really gives you insight about who you are. We grew up around a handful of of uh, you know firsthand linguists, and um, so that was a huge impact on me. Is having having that guy say, "This is your job now. It's your generation." And you know what he told me. He said, just take a lot of people there when you go do it. And it didn't really set into later what he really meant. And that was like, share it. It's not, you know, just about you. It's about everybody and share that knowledge. And so um, share that experience. And so from there, my work started um, get it, finding its definition, I'll say. And that's when I got into um, carving our traditional stuff because there was things that we needed. Uh, it didn't just end with the construction of the ceremonial house. Uh, that's when I started doing the stools. And so that's kind of the story behind the traditionally carved stools that, that I've been doing in the community through the workshops, is it all started there. And it was just the need for the ceremony and the family. And, and next thing you know, it kind of caught on and, and uh, I'll be finished up here now. It can be a long story because it's a journey, but uh, my dad always did this stuff. He was, he was a carver 
my grandfather was a carver and I never really thought about that. Never sunk in. And I said, well, you never really listen to your dad. Right. And so that's sort of my story. And then in the end, I find myself coming full circle back to something that our people have been doing for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's how the culture has impacted me. And that's why I'm on this part of the journey now. And like I said, I'm really starving to start doing some painting again. It's time to change it up. Nice. And, and what about you, uh, Chag? Well, it's great to hear from Almy and Shauna. And, you know, I think the power in culture, indigenous culture, and community is the multi-generational influence, the mentorship that is inherent in our ceremonies and in our indigenous uh, art. Um, you know, Almi talked about uh, ketamine. Uh, I was on the Humboldt Arts Council Board of Directors when they uh, transferred, they re-envisioned the uh, Morris Graves Museum of Art in Eureka, it was a library, that building. And so I was on the Arts Council board during that time uh, in 1999, uh, 2000, 2001. And I would walk out the side of that, uh, that building and there was a great big white wall that I would always look up at. And I would always think in terms of there's a canvas and I thought of two artists that uh, could use that canvas uh, in a way that uh, shows the power of our local native uh, communities there. And that was Almy and uh, Brian Tripp, BDT. And the really great thing uh, about being able to observe Almy over the last, and work with him over the last 20 years. So when I mentioned, uh, oh, there's this, opportunity uh, that I can help facilitate. There's this wall space. And can you think of a, of a mural? And Almy, we were at Cutamine when Almy said, oh, hey, Che, come here. And I went over there and he sketched out his very first design right there in the dirt, right next to the dance house at Cutamine for that mural. I mean, how powerful was that for me uh, so there's the connection, right? Uh, Almy is my mentor, and then I get to work with him. That place has such uh, beauty and spiritual power. And there, that place gave inspiration to Almy and to BDT, too. So then they created that mural, uh, which was the first indigenous mural in the city of Eureka, uh, and it needs to go back up. I know they took it down and they're talking about maybe putting it up near the Clark Museum. But uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that when they took that mural down, everything went to hell in this country. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I think of that. Uh, that's the power of our indigenous art. Uh, and then talking about Shauna and uh, her as a mentor for me and for so many other people like, you know, Baba, you know, you think of the power when we as individuals uh, in native communities see other artists and writers, and then we think, hey, we can do that. You know, we can aspire toward that. And that's the power of ceremony. That's why as families, it's so important for us to continue to get together because we reconnect in that way. Our young people see our artists and our language speakers. They hear our traditional singers and they think to themselves, I can do that too. It's my responsibility as well. And that's the inherent discipline that our ceremonies and our artists transfer uh, from generation to generation. It's the discipline and the responsibility and that you have to be healthy. You have to try and you know live your best life, uh, stay connected to your community, to your family. Um, and that's just, you know, uh, a little glimpse into, I think, the power of our indigenous artists. To me, the native artists like Almy and Shauna, they envision our, our future healthy pathways and they share it in their art. 
And it's up to us to look at that, to appreciate it, talk about it, to feel it. That's why artists are so dangerous, right? And I think when California was, uh, when the genocide that happened, uh, when California was founded as a state, they targeted indigenous artists first. They targeted our ceremonial people, our language speakers first, because they knew that you know, those are the people that guide us. Those are our mentors. Those are our elders. And of course they failed, right? Because here we are and you know, we're going to continue. Uh, but I, I really deeply appreciate uh, what Almi and, and Shauna share. And you know, I look forward to Almi's next uh, work and Shauna and I are going to work together soon too. Right, right on, Chig. Um, yeah, so going back to that a little bit, and here's that connection, folks. So, yeah, Chig, he's the facilitator. He, uh, he's seen what was going on, and uh, he's seen that, uh, you know, I could basically drive, be kind of a driving force to get this mural pinned up on the wall down there at the Morris Graves. And, oh, we went through the city of Eureka and all of that. And and, uh, and this was all happening during the reconstruction of Kutamine, 99, 2000. So yeah, that's that huge impact it had on me. Uh, and I remember what the city told us then is that, oh, we can't have any text on a mural or any reflectors or any mirrors. So they knew BDT's work was coming, <laughs> you know? So anyways, I thought, well, you're kind of singling us out here, but it ended up all working for the better. We were very good about it. The image got approved. And we, and we got it done. That was a really uh, neat time. And the only thing I want to add, you, you point me out as a mentor, but you know, really uh, with your work and um, one of my first uh, little mini grants that I got to do carving, uh, that was with your assistance there. And you, you, you inspired me to do that. And that's when I um, acquired um, some of my first ads as my traditional carving tools. And so uh, that, that was the beginning of that. So a lot of people see these workshops I've been involved in around here for the last four years. Well, really, you got to go back a little further. The idea started a long, long time ago. The journey. I, I kind of want to echo something, too, about Chegg, because he's, he's, he's always there working for everybody, you know, doing the back, a lot of the background work, too, but also putting his books together. But um, when you were at a, uh, Humboldt Area Foundation and directing Native Cultures Fund, I was able to get a grant for you to work with kids and so you know you've been you've been there this was in like 2005 or six or something so yeah we've all we've all been we've all been connected and helping each other out for a long time and and i think it's very powerful you know and i appreciate you sharing that shauna and you too almy in that uh, i look at like with my books like my latest book uh, I look at the process in how we as indigenous writers and artists uh, not only uh, find the resources to create the work, but how that work is then evaluated and assessed in our communities. And that's, I think, a next step that we as Native communities uh, need to uh, be critical and look at in terms of you know, for example, look at all the statues that are being taken down, like right now, literally today, you know, in California, the Sutter, the Columbus, you know, the, that's an example of uh, the power of imagery. The images, who controls the imagery controls the narrative. And for far too long, non-Native people have tried to control our narrative. And that's the power of art. So I look at you know, all these statues that are coming down and I think of nothing but opportunity for the indigenous artists in each of those communities to put something into those spaces and who can help facilitate that. Because our artists, you know, uh, the community, they have families, they have jobs, they need to have that structural support uh, there so that, you know, they can have the funding and they can have the help and the advocates. The advocacy is a huge part of uh, the uh, 
strengthening of our indigenous are in our communities. Thank you. Uh, and, and I guess I just wanted to see if there, because it's got mentioned a couple of times since we've been uh, uh, live, is about the connection and the interconnection of your all's work. And so if anybody wanted to add at all uh, about some of the interconnection, uh, at least you know locally around whether it's carving, whether it's poetry, whether it's uh, you know graphic art, artistry, like any more about the interconnection of the work. Uh, Almi? Well, um, you know, uh, there's things that I can do, and there's things that I cannot do. So realizing what you can do and don't try to do what you can't do. I can't write. That's Sean and Chegg's job. Okay. So that's what I'm all about. And those are the things that um, I think we all need to learn is that we're all born with certain talents and, and skills. How can you bring that forth? How can you make that pay dividends in your community? And I think that's why, why we're all here in a sense. And so, you know, uh, who's to say that eventually there's not going to be some big image up on a wall someday that maybe uh, I laid out and painted and maybe it's got Shauna's work on it. I mean, maybe that's where we're heading. Uh, Shauna's words. Um, I just appreciate that kind of stuff so much. And, uh, and it, but like I said, I can't do it. Um, graphic work is something I've gotten into lately. I do not do it alone. I work with people that are good graphic artists and I take my concepts and lay it down. And, you know, some of you guys have seen like some of the stuff I've been throwing out in the community. What's that, that really about is uh, uh, just getting messages out there. And I really don't care who does it. You know, I've got some of BDT's um, font and titles and then my background work. And then I throw it together with visual concepts and uh, work with down with them. And I just appreciate what, um, there you go. I appreciate what they can do. And I was talking to somebody of about this not too long ago. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, what would it take for me to get a basic setup so that I can start doing this on the computer? Well, folks that didn't see us getting warmed up here realized my wife put me on this computer. I'm not a techie guy. <laughs> my personal assistant, my PA, that stands for Pim Allen, by the way. Uh, <laughs> she, she hooked me up and um, I, I can figure it out. I'm getting better and better. Um, good thing my iPhone 11's got me on point. But yeah, this is some work here, uh, Indian land. And that's my grandson. It was transferred from a photo. And I, I worked with my guys over at uh, Visual Concepts to do that and uh, sat there in the chair with them, uh, had some ideas going. Actually, Chancey Carpenter, young Chancey, he sort of started the project. And then I took it over there. And, you know, I just think being inclusive with things like that just makes this public work stronger these messages in the community that's that's what it means for me thank you any anybody uh, would like to add to uh what elmi uh, had to say uh Chad, you want to talk about our collaboration a little bit sure i'd be on i'm honored uh sean and i are working on a uh, graphic novel uh i'm uh, writing five uh, stories for young indigenous people uh, and each story uh, revolves around uh, Yurok cultural perspectives on uh, uh, sky, water, earth, obsidian. Um, and Shauna is uh, going to write poetry uh, that'll accompany that will uh, be right up front in each of those stories. And the goal is to have this, uh, you know, published, created, you know, maybe by the end of this year, maybe uh, the beginning of next year uh, because of the pandemic and everything. But, uh, you know, what a dream come true that uh, I get to work with V, Shauna McCovey. And, you know, I look forward to when she and I uh, go out into the community and are gonna talk to young people. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, power. Again, going back to that mentorship, I was always inspired to write because as a young person, when I went through school, I never saw a living, a picture, a color picture 
of a living California native person in any textbook, in any school publication. I didn't see it in any uh, film work. So I was always inspired by the fact that we were completely missing from that. And now my hope is when young people see you know, me and Shauna and then me and Almi, we're gonna work together. You know, they can say, hey, you know, we can, there's our, there's our mentors. We can, we can do it also. And maybe even go beyond what they're doing. That's always my hope too. Like with any of my work, that young person will sit and read it and they'll say, oh, that's cool. But I think I can do something that goes beyond. Cause I know that that talent is out there. And, uh, you know, kind of uh, going off of what Bubba mentioned earlier about, you know, Shauna and her work uh, is so powerful. Uh, I mean, how many people have a JD and a published book of poetry, right? She's absolutely unique. And uh, I feel uh, like it is my privilege to continue to try to find ways to work with, uh, you know, artists and poets like Shauna and, and Almy. I have to say a couple of things. First of all, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Cause it's, you know, I didn't, I had to work really hard to do the things that I do. I know, I know a lot of people who just sail through law school, but uh, <laughs> I had to work really hard to get through that. Um, but no, when you approached me to, and asked me if I wanted to be a part of your next book, I was just like, wow, because of the respect that I have for your work and what you do and how you contribute to our culture and our people. And so I was, it was like immediately, yes, of course I want to work with you because I, I, want, I want to be a part of these things that you're creating as well. So I just want you to know that it's, it's very special to me and I'm, I'm deeply honored to be able to work with you. And Ami, I want to do that uh, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I think so. Um, got some ideas. We'll get there. Jay, good idea about all of the statues and monuments coming down. Yeah, it's yeah. a chance to, uh, to, uh, to reclaim. Actually, one of my favorite defacings wasn't, was actually pretty cool. It was the Yoda statue. And what they wrote at the bottom of the Yoda statue was, uh, 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 what did it say? Uh, matter they do black or black lives matter they do or you know how yoda would say that yeah and what's funny about that you know noun before the verb thing is that's how indians talk yeah. yoda talks like an indian it's true. So, yeah so that was one of my favorite defacings which i don't know i think it just kind of added to it for me one thing that is coming up uh as you all talk is you know i'm a psychologist trained and so one of the things there's a there's a native woman named stephanie freiberg and she has did research about this idea of possible selves that uh youth that uh this national research showed that that many native youth you know in the 90s 2000s they only saw in the media like three possible selves which was often like drugs and alcohol was often like this like stoic Indian that stuck in the past or this like brave Indian warrior or Pocahontas. And that's the images that they saw in the media. And she, she showed in her research that that impacted the youth's self-esteem, impacted that, their grades. And so as I hear you all talk, uh, I think of the, the, the ways that you are all impacting youth's possible selves of what they can become when they grow up. And I know that part of this, uh, the, the driving force behind this panel was, you know, to talk about art, talk about you specifically as artists and, and you know, really cultural leaders and, and role models in our community and wellness. And so I know Bubba, who is our youth coordinator, one of our youth coordinator has a question about the ways of integrating arts and you, you as people and, and for the youth. Yeah, you guys kind of um, mentioned it, you know, the mentorship pieces. Um, and I see all of you guys as a mentor in my life, you know, in many different ways. And so I just wanted to know what kind, and so I've had my own conversations with you guys individually and sometimes together, right? Um, and, but I just wanted to know if you guys had any advice for like young people that are trying to make their way um, 
you know, as, as an artist or trying to find, find their medium. Cause that can be, you know, that was one struggle that I had, you know, I tried the drawing and the painting route um, earlier in my life. And then, you know, for me, it wasn't so much, but, you know, I started working with Almy and, you know, I found that woodworking was a little bit more of a fit for me. Uh, and so I just want to know what you guys had, what kind of advice you guys would have for, for any youngsters coming up. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I think of Almy in many ways. Uh, what he already said is that, uh, you know, some people have talents I, I, and some people need uh, a lot of time to develop certain talents. And so my advice to any young person is try uh, as much as possible, try everything. Uh, it's okay to respectfully ask questions in your community. Uh, I think, you know, to be inquisitive uh, the good thing right now is we have so many on the North Coast. You have so many talented uh, educators and artists, musicians, writers. Uh, if there's a way, I mean, as Two Feathers, you're already doing this. You're already helping connect us, you know, to the community. But if there's a way to keep facilitating that, to keep giving a platform to more established artists, you know, like, you know, you see what Almy's doing with his... Uh, you know, the work on the stools, you get 20 people in there, right? And maybe 15 of them are gonna go that route. And the other five are gonna say, hey, I'm gonna, maybe I'm gonna do photography or I'm gonna be a writer, you know, but I had the experience. Okay, that's what we as young people, uh, what I see young people need, they need to have that ability to try and fail in a safe space mm -hmm. too. And to be told, you know, by, uh, by native mentors, it's okay, yeah, hey, you try it. Maybe do, maybe go this way out this way, this route. And so, you know, like with Shauna, you know, you, we, she is our, our, our poet of all poets and she's right there, you know, connect her up with young people, give, give your artists and your writers the chance and the ability that they've earned to have a platform to be in front of young people. And then for young people, please take advantage. You know, they, we're not that far removed from a time when it was dangerous to be a native artist in public. It was dangerous to be, it still is in some way, in some ways. So young people take advantage of the opportunities that programs like Two Feathers facilitate. Don't be complacent. Okay, that's, and that's part of the discipline. And as I get older and I look at my, you know, my wife and our two sons, you know, I think about them, you know, like, it's okay to, to have that discipline approach too, that, you know, this is a privilege. Indigenous art and language and mentorship, roles and ceremony, it is, a, it is a privilege, right? And there are and there are disciplines inherent in that to earn your role in those uh, aspects of indigenous culture. But that's the opportunity, right? A lot of people, go through life, they want to be connected to something larger than, than themselves. Well, here we are as Native people. You have that. You have, on the North Coast, oh, you have that. You, you, it's right there. The people are there. Yeah, so, yeah, my take is a lot like that. You know, some things, it's not your right. It's a privilege to participate. Uh, allowing uh, the youth to understand uh, everybody's roles and uh, and help help them find their place. You know, one of the things I try to inspire uh, them with or during these talks um, is that reminding everybody the culture that we're from and that it's a culture that's very rich in traditional art. Uh, we have and uh, we come from people that specified in certain trades in our culture. And that's why you see tremendous carving, tremendous weaving, uh, you know, and all of these things. And a lot of our people were trilingual. So we have to remind the youth of like, you came from this. And you remind those young women that, you know, uh, just because you got married off to another village the old way, you were always the teacher of those children. And so I think that's a really good point to point out is going back to our traditions and the way things uh, worked with our old value system. You know, 
And one of the things I think it was really neat and Lauren Baumlin was talking about it, that a lot of times the women of that village were bi and trilingual where the men only knew their own language. It's because they came from another village, okay? Or they came from another tribe traditionally. So I thought that was a really interesting piece because if you read and believe everything that the anthropologists wrote about us, you wouldn't see women put in that place. And I find that very powerful uh, to know that. But once again, getting back to it, the, the specific roles that we have and the very rich culture. And we have that rich culture because we come from uh, a very resourceful land. Uh, we didn't have to move around for food source. And so we were able to perfect our game, if you will. And so that, that's what I like to try to inspire with. And then for the young people, you know, my job isn't um, so much working with uh, the young ladies or the young girls, uh, but although uh, some of them do the mush paddle workshops and they're my most consistent students. <laughs> and, uh, they, you know, they want to take homework home and work on it and come back a week later. And uh, I think that's really cool. But my job specifically is working with the young men in the traditional sense and the way I came up and then the role that I have now, uh, the job is to make sure our traditions and our ways, um, especially with ceremony, trans transcends forward and is done uh, true to what we were being taught the whole time. So I think that's the tricky thing is today's generations, it's a whole different world out there, folks. It's a whole different world. When I was a kid, Shauna was a kid. I mean, there were still color or black and white TVs everywhere, or if you even had a TV, you know what I mean? Uh, it, things have, have changed. Um, I was the first uh, generation of Allens to actually be born in a hospital. Everybody else was born up there right alongside the river or at the home place at Camp Creek. So imagine that, how much have we changed since then? So Chegg and Shauna, those are our obstacles. Bubba, those are our obstacles. Virgil, that's, that's what we have to work on together is this generation, and we're doing it right now, you know, is having this venue for people to listen in, but finding those ways to impact this new generation uh, is, is, is really, is really going to be the thing because it's not really going to change a whole lot from here on out. I mean, technology is going to get better. Yes, but we have to find a way to, um, to hook, hook our, our, our kids in and keep them solid, keep that cultural foundation solid. Yeah, that's that's part of our responsibility that and then that we'll pass that down on to them and, and keep it keep going. But when I talk to kids, I just I like to tell them, you know, it, 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 you can do anything you want. If I can do it, you can do it because I come from down river. Like I grew up with no electricity. Our TV, we had two channels. They were fuzzy. Couldn't really see them. Um, you know, I and so I was outside a lot. Um, you know, you have to use your mind and be creative in that way. Um, and I love to paint, but I'm not good at it, but I keep trying, you know, and that's the other, that's another message I would say to kids. Like, I feel like, cause I feel like every tribal person, no matter where you're from, you have an artist inside of you. And, it, and, you, and you just need to take the time to figure out what that is. Kind of like what you're saying, Bubba, like, I'm not a painter, but I love to paint. And I've made a couple of things, but you know, my, my, um, my genre or the, the medium that I work in is words and trying to paint pictures with words. So, um, you know, my, I have nieces that are just exceptionally talented. Like my, one of my nieces, Kim, just taught herself how to weave. And I'm like, how am I, did, why didn't I get that talent? Like, you know, that's not my, that's not my, my role or that's not my forte, that's hers. And she's, you know, she's going to carry that on and, and pass that along and, and teach people. So. We all have something inside of us that's that this, this artist inside of us. And all those kids need to know that. They need to know that they can nurture that. And they can, and, and, and like Alma said, you, know, you come from this, these incredible artists, these incredible like, creators. And, uh, and they have that. That runs through them. And, um, and you know, they can tap into that. It's just, it, it, everything, is, everything evolves, too. Like my writing started off when I was young. But it changes over time, and and um, and my little niece, you know, she wants to. She's eight, and she wants to draw a picture, and she gets mad and frustrated because it's not the way. It's not like what Almi said. It's not in her mind. She's not. She's not able to create what she's seeing yet. But if you practice and keep doing that, you know, 
everything takes practice and patience and, and eventually you get there when you, when you tap into that. Jag, you know, maybe both with your role, uh, your former role at uh, Native Cultures Fund and in your, your, I think you've done a lot of work around youth. So you have anything to add? Um, well, I, I have the highest of hopes for our, our Native youth, especially up there on the North Coast, because they have people like you and Bubba, and, you know, you have good staff at Two Feathers. You have some agencies that are doing their best to incorporate the best practices of indigenous cultures into their work, into their missions. Um, you know, to, to California native youth especially, I just encourage them. Uh, I think there's a lot of us that are on social media, so it's a way to connect to us in that way. I mean, I'm on Facebook, anybody wants to ask questions, I'm free in that way. Um, I think that there is, if you look at what's going on in the world right now, in terms of racial uh, equity, social justice, young people, this is your time. Uh, we need you. Uh, don't wait to be the leaders, be the leaders now. And you've got the mentors, you've got the teachers. Uh, there's more resources now. Um, and, you, and like Almy said, you come from an unbroken line of thousands of generations of talented, creative people. I know, you know, in my privileged work, listening to a lot of language speakers, uh, there is no word for uh, art, the English word art in a, in a lot of indigenous languages. Art is not uh, seg segmented out. It's not siloed out of who we are in our everyday in existence. So I always look at like, you know, they are our artist warriors, our artist poets, our artist elders. And we have that and uh, whatever ways that we can work together, you know, that's why I appreciate something like this to keep networking amongst each other. Uh, one thing that I will share, you know, I'd still have the good partnership with the Morris Graves Museum of Art. You know, my plan is to get back into that space and, you know, ref uh, facilitate some more exhibitions. You know, always try and honor our artists in that way and get young people involved in that way. So maybe we can collaborate on something like that as well. And then lastly, uh, I really hope that we can focus on the whole funding side of indigenous art and culture, uh, because that is key. I mean, that's the world we live in right now. And how do we best uh, support our artists in that way? Um, that's, I think, something that I'm going to stay involved in. Thank you. And as a follow-up, just to narrow it in on a little bit of art, and you know, in these times of you know our president cutting well, science, but, you know, the, the, the arts in schools have been, you know, their attempts and very much uh, getting cut out of our schools. And so, you know, in these times with the coronavirus going on, there's a big push around mental health and the impact on mental health. And so I'm wondering in your, you know, whether it's in your own life or where you've seen some of your work heal heal around some of the, whether we call it historical trauma or we call it depression or whatever, where do you see the arts and healing happening? Uh, and perhaps it could be in your own life or where you've seen it. Uh, and maybe Shauna around, you know, cause I'm really curious around the, the poetry and uh, uh, words and stories. Yeah, um, I, feel, I feel like poetry and, and writing and especially about share, sharing about our culture, um, it, it, it can be healing, it is healing. Like a lot of my poems in the, in the Smokehouse Boys are really hard poems. Um, they were hard to write and they're hard for some people to read because they're, they talk about drug abuse and sexual abuse and alcohol abuse and you know, things that we don't, that we used to not talk about. And, and a lot of the times when I, when I talk about the poems in the book, I say, you know, I say to folks, we, in order to heal, we have to talk.
talk about these things. It's the, we got to get through it. It's the only way to get beyond it. And you know that that just when we talk about historical trauma, you know we have to have the conversations and we have to be brave and we have to say this happened to us. And I, I wrote this poem once about it and um, one of the about historical trauma and about pain and um, you know just people who who are hurting and trying to numb that because uh, they don't know any other way to, to cope. And so um, the last line was like, it was never our disgrace, but it is our forgiving. And so we have to be able to come to this place where we forgive, we don't forget, but we, we forgive a lot of the, the past harms. Um, we continue to tell our own stories in our own words and our own versions. And I think that that's gonna lend to our um, to our to our healthy a healthier version of ourselves. If we can tell our stories and our versions, we can we can accept that the past happened, but we but we can also move forward and become the beautiful people that we are, you know, and realize that that we are not this we're not these people that this bad thing happened to. We're still alive, we're here and we're vibrant and we're proud people. And we're gonna keep doing the things we're doing. Thank you. And Almi or Sure. Yeah, so just adding on to Shauna's there, yeah, we're, we're from healers. That's what our people are, you know. Even before all of these big wounds were inflicted and this dominant society crashed in on us, we're, we're uh, world renewal people. We're fix the earth people. So if you're really going to wrap it up, you know, with us and probably the words of Julian Lang more than mine. See, I got all these guys to bounce off of and listen to. It's, it's, uh, it's a pretty fortunate space that I found myself in, you know, I got lucky. I got lucky to have people looking out for me and trusting me with their songs and stories, you know, and then, you know, the gratification of uh, working on a ceremonial house or being connected to our, to our old villages and doing ceremony. There's the gratification right there. But uh, in seeing that healing, firsthand right there where there were healing a sick baby and three tribes come out you know and put up dance all night sing songs bring their medicine um you know that's just i mean that that's enough definition right there but then being able to take that and for my story the to where it transcended into um like say the Eureka Bay Trail Project, uh, the People's Return, uh, where I took some of that knowledge I was telling you about with the carving, and then um, and then uh, created this space out there that's dedicated uh, to Weot life and culture. And so, you know, you just just being part of that, being asked to be part of that as an artist, was very. Um, very gratifying. Um, and, you know, probably once or twice a month, somebody sends me a picture of themselves out at the, out at this, uh, this bench site. There were seven of them on the Eureka Bay trail. And, uh, you know, mine was for the, the we Out life and culture. And I call it the people's return. Uh, and what I'm talking about is the, the people, the people were here the whole time, the we Out people. It's just that some unfortunate circumstances are this, you know, that their center of the world got taken their whole life as, as well as ours got turned upside down. But theirs happens to be right here in the middle of the capital of Humboldt County. And we all know that tragedy. But what I wanted to throw into it is we know that and, and we know that history but how can we move on, carry that, but move on and turn it into a place of healing? Well, what I want everybody to realize is that all land is sacred. And every place you go, it's not just the center of the world or this place where we do dance or that, uh, this and that. It's every place. And to realize that, you know, that's been our responsibility since the beginning of the time is to take care of this place so that it can take care of us. And so that's why I call it the people's return. And um, so that's my gratification right there is that uh, 
people go by and they're so happy that, you know, Hey, there's a, like a selfie of somebody sitting on one of the concrete stools and whatnot. And I, I just really, really enjoy that. And of course, if you guys, uh, you, you identify that, that spiral design, it was taken from the mural. I excerpted that from the sunset twice on the people that day. And so when, uh, I think it was Libby Maynard, uh, put it out, called the artists and, I got the email and I was uh, coaching an AAU basketball tournament up in Medford and I'm sitting in this hotel. And I said, like, oh man, this is going to be so cool. I've always wanted to do this. And basically I sketched it out in 10 minutes and I just stuck to what my original thought was. I, I wanted to have these stools in a semicircle around the spiral. Uh, the, the Brian Tripp work there um, that's you know, we'll call it, uh, he calls it uh, into the spawning ground. And I placed those words on the, on the little kiosk, my artist statement sign next to it. And there you go. I mean, that's just what we're talking about is, is putting, putting those things together. Um, you know, I gave some of the funds to Uncle Brian. I said, hey, I'm going to use your words. Here's, here's some money. He's like, all right, you know, you know, and so I just wanted to make sure that he was covered in this and that he knew that he was a big part of it. And then I free handed that whole spiral. Uh, Bob Benson picked that out. He goes, you didn't grid that at all, did you? That's its own deal. I said, yeah, and it actually grew. The spiral got bigger by two swipes. It's different than the mural. I said, but that's about that's two generations since we did that mural. So I said, that's what it's all about. And that last swipe with the spiral right there, that's my grandson's um, that, that's that's his generation that's his line and all all of those geometric shapes coming together that's our fabric that's our dna being passed from line to line it's going to keep on going it's going to keep on moving it's never going to stop it's never going to end that's our people's lineage thank you very powerful and beautiful and chag uh you know, getting back to the, you know, the question of, of healing and art. And I know it, it was said before that the artists are the most dangerous people, right? Uh, because there's power inside them. And, and I think it's so fitting during these times of, of the importance of being well ourselves. And so, you know, returning to the question, just your, your thoughts, uh, any follow-up or anything thing about how art has helped you heal or you've seen others heal through art? Well, it was very healing for me to listen to Almy right there, because uh, I feel like I've been on that 20 year journey with him in a way with those spirals and his art. Um, I think that, you know, art and artists can be viewed as dangerous because art makes people feel emotions. And when you feel emotions, you might start to have questions. Governments don't want questions, right? They especially don't want questions from us native people. Uh, so I think that the power, the healing power of art and poetry, the written word, the, the traditional uh, ceremonies, uh, it's, it's in the people themselves. You know, that's the way that I look at it. It's the, the networking that we have. That's what they tried to take away in the boarding school era. They tried to take away our connections within the families. You know, they, they've always tried to do that with us. The outsiders, the dominant uh, society has always viewed indigenous people and in art as some type of threat, which I don't understand because the reality is they need us to survive. They need our best practices and our indigenous knowledge to have uh, clean water and clean air. How do you th who do you think managed that? Who do you think had a relationship up on the North Coast with those river systems, right, for thousands of years? And those stories, those disciplines are contained in the art. So I appreciate uh, you know, like yourselves and any other uh, agency or organization that continues to collaborate with Native artists to give them the platform that they deserve, that they've earned, 
at this point and that our world needs in a big way. So they keep sharing their uh, knowledge and keep healing. Uh, I can only speak for myself how much I've been able to heal when I've, you know, looked at and thought about and felt, you know, when I've read Shauna's work, when I view Almy's painting, when I sit on his sculpture work, and I've done that in that community. And, you know, and I think about things. So I appreciate them very much. And I appreciate uh, you and your leadership and, you know, I, I, like I say, I have high hopes with Two Feathers and other agencies in that area to give our young people that healing that they need. Thank you. So we're getting close to, uh, we're about at an hour mark here. Um, I noticed that um, there was a couple of questions on the Facebook comments among many other positive affirmations and uh, you know, comments of gratitude for, towards you guys. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and blend the questions into one. Uh, the first part is serious, uh, or you know, and then the second part is kind of a kind of a funny question. Uh, the first part comes from Nation Richards, who's one of our mentors at um, Two Feathers, and she wanted she you know heard what you guys were were talking to the youth about, and so she wanted to know what the youth could do and how um, how they can make an impact. And uh, to be more impactful for change in a healthy way was her comment. And then the second part comes from uh, Mr. Corey Gray, and he wants to know who's the best basketball player out of the three of you. So I'll go ahead and let you guys answer one at a time. I can tell you who's the best baseball player. <laughs> no, uh, tell us. Almy, Almy's the best baseball player. Mr. Golden Arm. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, how do you, uh, how can the youth be involved? You know, I, I just say that uh, being able to have patience to listen and take that opportunity to connect, connect to the other generations, you know, and be in the moment, be in the moment. Um, we have a little rule in my family is that if it's dinner time, don't be pulling out a cell phone unless you're unless you want to read it to everybody at the dinner table, what's being texted. Okay. But be in the moment. And I say that in the most earnest way, because um, that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to have people pass things on to me because I would listen to them and, and, and just be there. And um, you know, it wasn't until recently I, I started doing a little bit of social media. I still won't do Facebook because I always thought, I'm a here and now person. If you're not here with me now, then you're not going to get what I'm doing. But I finally conceded to an Instagram account so people could see my art. Other than that, I always said, you know, you want to send Almy a message, you better put it in the mail or send a carrier pigeon because I'm just old school like that. I'm, I'm hands on. So that's my message to the youth is, is don't be afraid to roll up your sleeves and, and get involved in what with one of the elders or one of the people just hang out with them. And uh, as Bubba may know, because he became one of our sidekicks over the years, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And what I see Bubba doing today, that's a benefit of his experiences of moving back home, being involved with different people up and down the river. And it makes you a more diverse person, you know. So I can't say specifically what you can do, but just be there in the moment. Um, and uh, what was the other? Oh, best basketball player yeah probably Chegg really intramural basketball you know at Humboldt State he always broke out the uh the Magic Johnson jersey so he was Showtime Lakers man he's old school yeah best basketball player Chegg for sure he had patience and uh he could drop the dimes when he wanted to if he if he wasn't feeling it you weren't good you weren't going to get a pass from that Magic Johnson <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, we had all we had all native intramural teams when I went to HSU, and uh, I think we should have a three-point contest at the next HSU big time, 
and uh, have have a, some type of uh, artistic award for the winner. Um, <laughs> I accept that challenge. <laughs> nice. Uh, one thing I, I would say about uh, um, what youth can do is just um, when it comes to writing too, it's like if you if you're if you're a kid who likes to express yourself or, or and, you, and you're not sure or you've got maybe you're a kid you've got a lot of feeling inside you and you just don't you know you don't know how to express those things. Writing is really such a good way to do that. You don't have to write the perfect poem. You don't have to write the perfect journal entry. You know, you just put it down. You just put it down and get it out. And I think sometimes that um, that helps whatever situation you might be in. Um, but just to keep doing it, keep keep putting words on paper if, if that's something that that helps you, you know, get through whatever it is you need to get through. Jack. Just to sum up, also, uh, nobody makes perfect work the first time, and nobody makes perfect work the hundredth time. So when you go down that pathway, you know, go easy on yourself, too. There's a reason that it takes time to learn the discipline in, in the arts and in culture, and it's okay. You're not going to turn into a master, for the most part. There's always... Some people that could, but it takes time and you're going to fail and you're going to have sometimes people that you need to help you. You know, maybe they might not be able, in a position to help you, but keep looking because there are people out there. You're never alone. That's the thing about the great thing about indigenous people and culture that I was taught, fortunate to be taught, that we're never really alone in this life. Our ancestors are always with us. We, our family, you know, our, our, our culture, you're never alone. You're, you're not on the journey alone. Thank you. And so uh, any, uh, Bubba, I wanted to turn it over to you uh, if you had any last comments, but I also want to let the audience know uh, that to, uh, tomorrow uh, we have to reschedule our uh, speakers, Dr. Sarah Chase. Uh, she's going to be in August now. Uh, she uh, just, we had to do a little rescheduling, but she'll still be uh, giving a talk. It's just going to be later in the, the summer. And so, uh, Bubba, I wanted to throw it over to you. And, and if you want to throw it over to our guests or anything for some last words. Yeah, uh, I'll just finish by saying thank you guys so much for uh, agreeing to be here today. And also thank you guys for being a part of my life. You know, I mentioned earlier that each of you is a mentor to me um, in one way or in multiple ways. Um, and so I look forward to going, you know, going forward in the future. Um, so if anybody has anything to say before we wrap it up, I'll leave it open. I'll say something real quick. I want to thank you guys for doing this from Two Feathers for, for hosting this and bringing people out to talk. And um, I've watched a couple of them and I, I, I really enjoy it. And uh, I want to say thanks to Alm and, and Chad cause, and, and you, Bubba, because we're, you know, we're all family. We're family. We're all related. And uh, we're just going to, yeah, we're just going to keep working together and, and doing what we're supposed to do, what, what our responsibility is. I think we said it and um, it, it, a part in this interview that really that I'm going to take home with this um, is that, you know, the certain challenges of our generation, and I can see that in a lot of different ways, but ours directly to help this thing, help this, this, uh, this art thing, um, get on a vehicle and be moved into the next generation, but also Getting back to what we're looking at in the larger society, uh, what's going on in the world with the pandemic, um, you know, I just kind of asked the question, do we think our generation wasn't going to be impacted by something like this? You know, going from our grandparents being shipped off to boarding schools, to the impacts of uh, uh, that, that were then cast upon our parents and then to us, you know, so we all have traumas too. We're carrying those scars. We're all a little bit damaged goods and then I look at this generation and I see man you know is this the generation that finally is a little bit less scathed by what has happened to our people 
And I'm very, very proud of a lot of the young people and especially the ones in my family that are standing up for, for this other huge thing going on in our country with not treating people right. You know, we have this history of it. And I just, I just want to um, credit that the young people out there that are standing up for Black Lives Matter. Um, I was not active and vocal in this. And I, and I thought to myself, why was that after a week or two? Why am I being so quiet? And I thought to myself, it's, I went numb and it's from my own traumas and I couldn't be active in it, but I really, I'm, I'm right there. And that's this generation, you know, shining through. So I do credit them for that, where at that moment I'm, I'm coming, you know, I'm doing better now, but I really went, I went numb for about a week, you know, and it, and it brought me, it brought me back to, you know, asking those questions. So, um, I just want to say I'm still growing too and analyzing and realizing what's going on with me because you got to be right in order to go out and make things right in your community. So thanks to that young generation for trying to make things right in this country. Yotwa. Yotwa. Right on. Thank you guys. We'll talk soon. All right.